Well, seeing that it's Wednesday, you know what this is? Inventor's Workshop, here on the Flaming Brain. Okay, it's Inventor Wednesday, Invention Workshop Wednesday. Now, originally, I was going to start out giving my whole spiel on inventing, kind of like the history of inventors and inventing, um, all the steps you have to go through. Um, but I decided that for this first episode, rather I just tell kind of a fun and very interesting story. So back about 1990, back about 1978, I was working in a lumber yard in the summer. It was very hot and I had to wear a hard hat. And the hard hat made my head get so hot and sweaty, it was quite unbearable. So one day I had an idea about putting a fan in a hard hat and using solar cells to power it since you only really need it to run when the sun was out. So originally I just took a hard hat and I mounted a motor to the back, but it just blew at the back of your neck. It didn't do much good. So I decided I needed to make my own helmet that was more streamlined and would encourage the air to flow around the inside and come out the front and sides. So that's, this is the design right here. And a couple of years later, I decided to actually build a prototype, which ended up being my first prototype I ever built uh, of one of my inventions and this is it here I called it solar hat for solar hat and you can see it's got um, solar cells embedded in the surface and back here is the little fan and yeah it worked really well for its day but remember this was like 40 years ago or more and solar cells were not all that efficient in those days Neither were the motors. So now it's a whole different story. Now to build this, I took a regular hard hat and I used modeling clay to shape the back. Then when it was done, I made a plaster mold of it. And when the plaster mold was completed, then I was able to fiberglass the inside of the mold and come out with this finished product. And um, like I said, it was not as efficient as it, it would be now with newer solar cells and motors. Um, so anyway, I lost track of this um, for, I, you know, not too long after I built it, I just kind of lost track of it. So in 2001, when I was building my rocket, I had a Japanese network that wanted to come over and shoot me, not shoot me, shoot my project for uh, three days, which was, the longest um, duration that any television network or channel wanted to come out and shoot. And they asked me a question, do you, do you still have your hard hat? Because they saw it online. There were two pictures of it on my website. And I informed them, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what happened to it. So uh, when they arrived on a Monday, I believe, the following day, Tuesday, a FedEx package arrived. But it wasn't addressed to me, it was addressed to them. And when they opened up the box, lo and behold, this was what was inside. They had actually, just by those two drawings, duplicated my helmet so closely that I'm now beginning to wonder if, in fact, this was the one I built and somehow it ended up in, in Japan. I don't, I don't know, but it, it's uncanny because every angle I look at this, it is... It is as close to being exactly like mine as I could expect. So anyway, they built it because they wanted to do a little segment on their show um, about ostensibly me and all the rotten jobs I had and how I kept looking to do something that would give me independence from employment. Um, so they did this little skit that showed this guy doing several different things. And then he comes up with his idea and he goes out and pursues it, but unfortunately it fails. So, um, 
anyway, they did this little skit where the guy was wearing a hard hat, a regular hard hat, and he was sweating and wiping his brow. And then he came up with the idea, and they showed him wearing this one. Um, and so they brought it for me. And when they were all done, they let me keep it, which was kind of cool. Uh, but not too long ago, I was wondering if anyone else had the idea to do this. So I went online to see if anyone was making a solar operated uh, ventilated hard hat. I actually found a bunch. This is one that I found. And there's your solar cell, there's your fan. But what I didn't like about this is it just blew, just like my original idea where it blew at the back of your neck, this one just blows right on your forehead. I personally, I think my design was better. But it's kind of cool when you invent something and no one is interested, but then 20, 25, 30 years later, people are, come on to the same idea. I also thought that this would be a good time to talk about my biggest, most successful product, the Light Chaser. So back in uh, 1997, on a dreary Saturday afternoon, I went down to my shop and said, let's come up with something new. So that's what I did. I went down and I had this idea. And three hours later, and with no expenditure because I had all the parts, I had created this little thing which I really thought was cool, and I figured kids would love something like this. And um, so I licensed this to a company called SRM Entertainment. That's SRM as in Stephen R. Mickelberg. And I licensed to them. I got a $5,000 advance. I truly believe that would probably be all the money I would see. And in the beginning, it didn't do too well. Uh, this is the version that they, oh, there's no batteries in here. Just a second. Okay, I got new batteries in here, but yeah, this was the original. And in the beginning, um, it didn't do very well because they just came in a little box. No one knew what they were, what they did. And they were almost about ready to just drop it all together when finally they did what I had suggested in the beginning and make them as a Try Me product. And once they did that, it exploded. They first started out at Barnum & Bailey in the circuses because... It was a dark environment, lots of kids. It was the perfect setup to sell these, and they were selling hot. And all of a sudden, I started making money. I think my first royalty check, once it started taking off, was for $75,000. And then the next quarter, it doubled. And the next quarter, it doubled. Uh, of course, a third of that went to my agent, but still, I was getting checks after a couple of years, I was getting quarterly checks for two fifty, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 or more. Uh, and it was unbelievable, the change in my life that took place. Um, some good, some bad. Uh, but it was amazing. And then it went to Disney, and it became this phenomenon. I went to Disney World and Disney uh, Land, and at night, Every single kid had one of these. There were kiosks every 50 feet selling these. It was, it was a frenzy with people wanting these things. And they sold a billion dollars worth. And to me, though, the greatest part was um, I used to get emails from parents of special needs children telling me that this product had been the most important thing in their child's life and it brought them out of their autism, or I brought them up to, up to surface, let's say. But I got all kinds of emails with, with special needs kids, and the parents were just going over and over how important this had been. The most touching one I got was a little seven-year-old guy, seven-year-old girl died of a brain tumor, and she had my uh, light chaser in her hand when she passed, which was pretty hard to, you know, that's a big gulp. 
But yeah, I used to get emails that would have me like in tears just listening to what this toy had meant. I get emails from EMTs and psychiatrists and counselors, and they always kept them around for their young patients to uh, keep them occupied. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's really great when you can make, make millions of dollars off of an invention, but it's even better when you find out it has an importance in the life of children. So that was my course, and it, it sold for about 12 years. And um, the amazing thing is it was never patented, and no one was ever successfully able to rip it off because Disney was really the place to sell these. And Disney was very loyal to um, its, its vendors and the people that supplied products to them. So they would never buy a knockoff anyway. But yeah, it pretty much had died out by about, oh, I'm going to say around 2012, 2013. Uh, they just production was slowing down and, and people weren't buying them as much. And that was it. But even today, if I go into a room of let's say 50 people between the ages of 30 or between the ages of 25 and 35 um 48 of the people in that room will have will know that toy it was, it was that well seen um back in the day when kids were young because see this started selling in 2000 and so if a kid was 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 eight when they bought it then let's see that'd be 24 and 8, that guy, that person would be 32 years old now. So, anyway, it was amazing, um, incredible thing. Um, and I never hit anything even close to that again. That was my one big deal. And it was a big deal. This is all that remains of my collection, which used to number 118 different versions. And um, as you can see, this is what they all do. Um, yeah, kids just love these. A billion dollars in sales in about 12 years. And it was amazing. So anyway, um, I'm going to cut this short at this point. And... Um, Next next Wednesday, I'll have a ho another whole beginning, and I'm going to talk more about the inventing history and everything else involved. Um, you know, an interesting fact, back around the turn of the century, from the 18th to the 19th, no, from the 18th to the 19th, in other words, turn, I always get mixed up when you say turn of the century. Anyway, going from 1800s to 1900s, at the beginning of the century, there were people actually suggesting that the patent office be closed because the general consensus was, well, everything that needs to be invented has already been invented. Now, can you imagine that, that 124 years ago they were saying there's nothing new to be invented? It's like, wow, how wrong were they? So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this, and please remember to hit the like button, hit the the subscribe button and tell everybody you know about the flaming brain.